So, you know, democratization came up last time, and I don't know, maybe you guys have a different point of view on that uh, word, but um, let me just quickly introduce our really interesting panel on participatory biology, which is also known as biohacking or can be viewed in a lot of different ways, and we'll try to view it a few different ways in this session. Uh, starting here, Ari Gentry, who is a taconomist, uh, but a very experienced techonomist, we've had her in our programs before, who is the uh, Technology Horizons Research Manager at the Institute of the Future, but also a, a key founder of BioCurious uh, prior to going to Institute of the Future. And I'm going to ask her how she got to that, because she's not a trained scientist, but she's really a leading biohacker and, and somebody who's helped create a lot of that opportunity. Next, Ryan Bethencourt, who is the CEO of Berkeley Biolabs, which is a biohacking space and also incubator, who himself is a longtime entrepreneur in biotech. Uh, he's also just been named the senior director for prize development in uh, biotech for the X Prize. Yeah. So he's now going to be overseeing a new set of prizes that the X Prize is going to give in biotech, which just happened. Yeah, right? like two days ago. Two days yeah, ago. Yeah. So that's a very cool new news item for Ryan. Yeah. And finally, David Hausler, um, a, 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 another really well known uh, scientist at the UC Santa Cruz and the director of the Center for Biomolecular Science and Engineering there who is a trained computer scientist who has spent his career mostly in biology, applying the tools of IT and analytics and data to biology, which is very much, as, as I was happy that Drew Endy referred to, something that is motivating us to do this event, to try to bring these worlds more into contact. And, and he sort of yeah. em emblemizes exactly why we think we're here in part. Um, so thank you for emblemizing that, David. He also works with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. But I guess maybe um, I, I would start with you, Ryan, to talk, ask you this question. Is, is democratization a word that you uh, would use freely about what's happening in bio research and, and development? Yeah, so I, I, I talked to Craig Venter a little bit about um, the word de democratization, biohackers. He's not, he's not a huge fan of biohackers, uh, but he likes the shift from viewing biotech and biotechnology, shifting away from just medicine to include everything. So I would say uh, democratization is a word I've used before, but I would say it's more an expansive view of biotech, the fact that it can be everything. And I, I, I love Drew Endy's talk earlier where he brought that up. So, so I think that's what we're looking at. So um, with Berkeley Biolabs, that was really our vision. We founded it to really take on the fact that we're trying to accelerate everything in biotech. And so everything can be really diverse and often consumer facing. So you take it as a given that by bringing more people into the process who are sort of non-traditional actors, so to speak, yep. we will discover more and discover it faster. Most ha definitely. Has that been demonstrated yet or is that an article of faith? Uh, yeah, so we had, um, we, had, we had a hack night. Um, we hacked a genome, uh, Carcinella rudi. It's a, it's a, a, um, a symbiotic um, bacteria. And we had programmers, we had novices, we had some film people, um, we had wet lab biologists. They all got together. We had about 20 people in the lab, and we spent uh, two days hacking the, the genome, figuring out where all the parts were. We found that there were some missing tRNA. Uh, we found um, some really interesting processes. And so we started this whole process of looking into it. We've also seen, so one of the other groups that I've been involved in, which, was, which is Counterculture Labs, I'm still a board member there, um, it's really focused on citizen science. So Counterculture Labs it takes in people from every possible um, trade or, or area of interest in, in bio. So total novices to experienced people too. Okay, you know, I, I want to go to David first, and then I want to ask Ari to talk to us about how she got to where she is, because it's, it's an interesting story, and I think it's, it's indicative of what's happening sort of in society with, around biology. But you, know, you represent, David, something slightly different than sort of these biohacking wet labs with all this equipment. I mean, you're really about access to data as a driving force in biological progress, right? So just let me start by asking you, I mean, Again, is it an article of faith that that's going to make a difference, or is it already proven that that's making a difference? Uh, well, yeah, I do feel a little more establishment in this crowd, uh, uh, but but you're uh, not dressed accordingly. I'm not Thank dressed you. Thankfully, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, I I think it's a proven fact that when you open up the information that we are gathering now in 
in the, in the, in the scale of petabytes about the molecular nature of ourselves uh, that everything moves faster. So it's all about opening up the data. Uh, that, if that's, the, if you want to use the, the word democratization, fine, I might use liberation, um, but that's what it is. Uh, the, the data that pertains to ourselves and to the problems uh, that we're attacking in society, in particular our human health, are often locked up. And in a, in a, I'm especially sensitive to the human health data. These uh, data that are now going to be collected in enormous quantities uh, due to the advent of genome sequencing and other ways to quantify ourselves now uh, from uh, continuously running devices will be inaccessible to the world if we follow the current medical establishment methodology where everything is siloed into separate uh, medical institutes and not really shared. Uh, and the thing is that you cannot learn anything about yourself if you only have information about yourself. It's all about comparison to the rest of the world. And if we block that, we lose an enormous opportunity. And so you, what your work is kind of all about access, right? Yes. That's, that's a, you're kind of an activist for access. That's right. And, and we talked on the phone about some of the ways. Could you just like go through the different kinds of access that you're working toward? Because there are several different types. Well, yeah, we, we, we posted the first working draft of the human genome on the internet in, in, on July 7th, 2000. That was the first step. It was humanity's first look at its basic genetic blueprint. And, and that and you, was you were you were lead, lead, one of the leaders of the team that did that. Yeah, yeah. it was our team at Santa Cruz, uh, and that was the, you know in contrast to having paid subscription access or highly controlled access. So at that point, we have the whole world looking at one reference genome, one typical genome. If you fast forward. The next phase was trying to learn a lot about personal genomes. And one of the things that's really driving personal genomes is, is cancer research. And I, you know, I loved Andrew's presentation earlier on. Uh, one of the quotes that he gave uh, that I'll repeat is, no two cancers are uh, the same. That's absolutely true at the genetic level. But there are patterns. And we only will see those patterns when we can actually see millions of cancer genomes at the DNA level. If you just see a few, you can't find the pattern for the background or the noise. You can't separate signal uh, from noise. In order to do this, we have created for the National Cancer Institute the largest database of genomes that are widely available for scientific research from all of the major projects of the National Cancer Institute. It's 1.5 petabytes of data. And we now actually distribute to the research community more data every month than the entire National Center for Biotechnology Information combined mm. at this point. And that's one of the ways in which we try to get, enable the, the, the community to think together, think collectively about these things. The last thing we've done is start the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And I, GA4GH, you can, you can Google it. Uh, seven colleagues and I have started a new uh, international organization to try to break down the barriers, both legal, cultural, procedural, historical, and otherwise. That's a lot of old. Yeah, old, old crap that keeps people from wanting to share data. And that, that uh, organization is going to set standards, applications, programming interfaces that will allow us to share data on a massive uh, scale and set the tone for a, a world in which you, you have a routine economy of information about DNA and other measured uh, health-related quantities uh, that's well established to the point where you can build a new business on it. Right now, we're kind of like, trying. if you're trying to get in this area right now, you're a little bit hampered by the fact that it's almost like trying to get an internet uh, company going before the internet was really fully established. Once, though, once that platform that we all agree on in terms of global standards for exchange and representation of this information is hardened, then we have enormous economic opportunities from the private sector. Wow. Well, that's, that's really good stuff. Um, so, Ari, uh, 
tell us a little bit about BioCurious and how you got there. And then I would also like you to talk a little bit about the work you're doing at the, at the Institute for the Future, because there's some interesting sort of uptake on your bio work that seems to be happening among the companies you work with that are clients of, of that, that group. So right. what, what led you to become a biohacker? So it starts with the childlike curiosity that many of us have, and I try to reference that as often as possible because it puts people in a different mind space. You know, they look to the corner and start thinking about when they were a kid and everything was novel and everything was something that you could understand before they differentiated into their lives. So that was a curiosity that I had participating in science competition, Science Olympiad, which is an awesome service for kids, by the way. And then I got to college where the reality of being an economist, which I ended up being uh, literally, or being a biologist, was a decision that I had to make which would forever change my life, apparently. And uh, that's when I decided as a naturally shy person to take the more social route because I realized how important that was for life and for business and to put myself on the pathway to science. Uh, Freudian slip toward finance, which I ended up pursuing <laughs> after college. Um, and as I was offered uh, basically a raise and a better position within my company, and I was an asset manager at the time, I thought I was so bored and I'd stopped learning and I wasn't really doing what I loved. And kids today have the luxury of feeling that and then doing something about it. Um, <laughs> which might show you that my parents still have no idea what I'm doing or <laughs> why I'm not thinking purely about a job and making money. Um, so I look back to where I spent all my free time. And um, in college, I spent a lot of sleepless nights working on papers, but also uh, researching my dad's condition, which for most of my life was a present factor. He was in a lot of pain, um, didn't know what was going on, had gone through lots of surgeries and many doctors and still was just left with complaints and not much help. So um, when I was around a junior in college, he got a fatal diagnosis. But for me, that seemed like bunk, because basically the diagnosis didn't seem like uh, the symptoms that he had expressed throughout my lifetime. So I started doing digging. And the best way that I could find answers was to self-filter through thousands of posts that people would share about their health condition, what they were doing to make things better, whether it was supplements, doctor treatments, using heat, cold, yoga, everything I read through. And it's a mess out there, but that was the best wisdom that I could find. And through all of that data, you eventually find some people who have sometimes used 23andMe and done some crowdsourcing crowdsource research of their own to find out, hey, we all have common symptoms, and it happens that we share this genetic defect, or. Like a cruder form of what David was talking about, a cruder systematizing form. It's at, a very community-driven yeah. yeah. thing, and mm -hmm. people are highly motivated to participate in their own healthcare, and when it comes down to medicine, it means in discovery. So there's clearly a separation between how we define scientific discovery today and what people are doing off on their own that most people, most corporations and researchers aren't paying attention to. Uh, but for me, that was a sea change. And I started respecting the wisdom of the crowd or those individual researchers as they were in my mind and wanted to follow suit. Because you ended up figuring out that your father had something other than how he'd been diagnosed, right? Right, so he was diagnosed with emphysema, which is a fatal condition, and it didn't match up. So I finally found out he had Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, where I suspected it, and so it was later confirmed, which is an anomaly in connective tissue. So quite different, um, but the doctor really didn't know the difference and it takes a genetic test to figure it out, or the other way of figuring it out is literally to do, uh, you know, have them bend over or check out their skin, check out their spine when they bend over for scoliosis or for anomalies, pull up their skin and look at stretchiness. You can just talk them through their own health history, and if you know what to look for, and that's what I had basically trained myself to do, then 
you have some indication of what might be the underlying disorder, which can be fact-checked and hopefully improved later so, through genetic analysis. So fast forward to BioCurious now. Right. So fast forwarding that original example of wisdom in the crowd and redefining expert to me, um, me not having any scientific experience except what I was compelled to do in my free time, um, I wanted to learn more and couldn't find any way to even get an education in science without going back and getting a PhD, which I didn't want to do. I don't like school. Um, didn't at the time. I respect it, I should say. Um, there had to be a better way. So it took me several years to find some people who would let me volunteer at their little research camp. And that's where I met the people who were a world apart from any financiers I met, um, totally genuine about wanting to save people's lives, working on uh, diseases of aging at the SENS Foundation. And I met friends there that I wanted to model myself after, um, not knowing enough. Uh, I volunteered for whatever I could, including um, helping them find lab space, equipment. We actually visited Ryan's space in LA once, and he had a locker full of equipment. And there, are, there were all these resources that were just going unused, yet if you're a scientist in an academic lab, you know that things cost crazy amounts of money because they're in your budget. So it helps to have expensive equipment that you can budget in so that you can continue to have that big budget next year. Um, and I'll mention Tito Jankowski right there, also a co-founder of BioCurious, um, in terms of open source data. Because when we're talking about patents, um, patents don't allow you, if you're a hacker, to go and take that design and then find a much better and cheaper way to do it. Yet when PCR polymerase chain reaction, kind of a DNA copier, came out of patent, he and Josh Perfetto decided to make an open source version of it. And rather than that $10,000 machine, they were able to offer it for $599. And that's the kind of thing that can happen when designs are made available. And there's not someone telling you, hey, don't touch that. But it opens up the doors for people to participate in this domain, to have fun, to just learn. And that doesn't mean a lot to some people, but there's always going to be that one who takes it a step further. So finding people like Tito and realizing that there were all these tools, and when the alternative was that you could spend 1000 to $6,000 per month just to rent lab space in the Bay Area, which is totally out of range for someone who's just curious, um, hence the name. Um, or even who's an entrepreneur who's so early stage they don't have funding yet. Those so, people are going to be out of the game. So, so you started with some meetups with the lab you yeah, already so had, and pretty soon you yeah, know, it when led you to BioCurious. When you don't have money, you just get people together. Um, so out of our garage lab in Mountain View, by that time we had started a nonprofit cancer research company. Um, long story behind that. but. Um, People wanted to volunteer, and they wanted to come, and they wanted to learn. And that's when you start asking, why aren't there ways for people who are so passionate and so clearly brilliant to actually get in on the game? Because we need change. We need cures. And so we thought we have to do something about it. Um, there were six of us who banded together and raised money on Kickstarter as a second science project on there when they were in beta. $35,000, that's what we thought we needed to start a lab. And um, now, four years later, I realize it's kind of silly and naive. You need much more than that. But we did it anyway. And we still have the lab in Sunnyvale, which allows anyone um, with any background, just like counterculture labs, to join at $100 a month. Um, that's a reduction, a tenfold reduction in price from the standard around the Bay Area. And what happens there is people get together. And speaking of the language that Drew mentioned, when you have an artist and a musician, an economist, a game developer, and a scientist, OK, so a biologist and a physicist coming together, and they're trying to talk about hacking a bioprinter, um, something which Patrick de Heisler right here has done, you don't get anywhere by using biological or, or physics terms. You have to speak like the common man, person. And when you can do that, you can gather wisdom from the crowd. And that's the kind of thing that happens at BioCurious, which is hugely encouraging. 
And that's where things are happening that haven't been done yet. Um, like the bioprinter that you can find on Instructables that's won a number of awards. Um, I think Anthony is here who, uh, with a member of BioCurious, started Glowing Plant, which ended up raising half a million dollars on Kickstarter. Uh, it's changing the name of the game in terms of participation and education. Genspace and BioCurious were named a top four company by Fast Company um, for education. And it's... We're going to hear about Genspace a little later, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and you'll see, actually, it's a tight-knit community that crosses over into um, tech as much as it does biology. And, and Ryan, you're part of that community. I now, am. And, and, and BioCurious was a real groundbreaking kind of experiment that became something really foundational. And now you are kind of taking something on top of that model and making it into a little more of a for-profit accelerator. Talk about that and talk about what the kind of things you think are going to be possible there. Yeah, and so may, mention also that uh, Al, Al gas thing. Oh yeah, so uh, I would describe myself for a long time as a frustrated entrepreneur. Um, I followed the, the classical scientific pathway. I did my first degree in molecular genetics, did a master's at Cambridge. It was a fusion between the MBA and the biotech course. And then I went off and I did a PhD. I dropped out stem cell research. Um, and, and I wanted to see progress faster in biotech. I didn't see it. Um, at the time, I actually met Aubrey de Grey. So my, our stories kind of link in. That must have been a trip. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Aubrey at the time was still in the Cambridge lab that he worked in. So I went over to him and I talked to him about life extension. Um, we connected, nice. he moved out here to Silicon Valley. Uh, Peter Thiel obviously helped him establish his foundation. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, kind of something was happening on the biohacker front. So there was a little, little house in Silicon Valley where there was a little lab from, and some of the, the kind of, the um, people from SENS that had just left SENS had decided they wanted to do science in their garage. And that's eventually what led to BioCurious. At first, it was Lively, then BioCurious. It was an interesting evolution. Um, but I still didn't see, I had a corporate background. I'd, I'd done a lot of like, corporate transactional deals with like, Big Pharma, Pfizer, Amgen, Genentech, helped them develop drugs. Still too slow. Uh, went off, helped build a couple of biotech companies. I started, raised the first seed rounds for two biotech companies, um, and, then, and then realized I still wasn't seeing what I wanted to see in DIY Bio. It led to the creation of Counterculture Labs with several other people, Patrick and some of the others, uh, from BioCurious, um, which was a much broader citizen science coalition. And I still saw some of the accelerators and the accelerator models, and I was like, is it too early yet to do this in biotech? And I'd been talking a lot with Anthony from Glowing Plants. He convinced me that consumer biotech is a thing, and it's going to be a growing thing. And I kept looking at it from a business perspective, from a science perspective, Felt the timing was right. I mean, consumer biotech, mean consumers making biotech products or? Uh, products for consumers that are in biotech. For so, consumers yeah. that biotech labs can develop. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you look at, so um, recently I gave a talk uh, over at Innovation Endeavor, that's uh, 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 Eric Schmidt's venture fund, which talked about the rainbows of biotech, right? So when you look at biotech, there's medical technology, which we're really familiar with, but then there's all of these other applications of biotech. So there's a company called Novozyme. Novozyme makes a little over a billion dollars in revenue off of engineered enzymes. So enzymes that clean our clothing, that help us brush our teeth. We don't have algal blooms because we no longer have sulfur in a lot of our detergents. Um, these are big markets already in their own right. We just haven't, as, as actually Drew was saying earlier, the economic potential of biotech from a consumer perspective is huge. Energy, food, um, materials, medicine, um, and then other novel applications as services as well. So that's what we're developing in the lab. So kind of to link that in. Yeah, and quickly get to Algas, and I want to get back yeah. to David to talk about some. Yeah, yeah. So the Algas. So Algas was parallel one of, issues in one IT. of our little startups. So we opened four or five months ago. Um, our idea is one scientist, one idea. We help them piece together kind of the commercial end and the scientific end. Myself and some of my co-founders, I raised a small seed round from a couple of tech investors and uh, one former Apple early Apple employee. Um, our aim is to accelerate these companies. We have five in. Uh, within the next two months, we'll have another eight, uh, a total of eight. Uh, one of them is Algas Biotech, which is the first one to get any major publicity, got in TechCrunch. Um, and it is an algae uh, battery, an algae bio battery, which if it works, as we hope it to work, uh, could change the way the, bio bat the, the battery industry works. So taking out lithium and using biological components instead. 
Yeah, that's, that's a nice example of yeah. where this goes in unexpected directions. Very, yeah. so, so David, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm curious to hear your opinion about, given that you, you teach and you've been an activist and you're talking to people globally about these coalitions to open up some of the data, how much do you see the kind of enthusiasm and willingness to kind of put your shoulder to the wheel that these young people are demonstrating as indicative of a movement that's, that's happening? Do you see that among your students? And, and, and what does it lead you to be confident is going to be possible once this openness that you're advocating for starts to happen? I see this definitely as, as a movement, and, and it is to a certain extent genera generational. Uh, I think this generation coming up um, in the, you know, in completely intertwined with the internet won't put up with the old style medicine. Uh, the, the whole medical establishment has not quite come around to the internet, uh, and that is unconscionable in many ways. Uh, there is an increasing demand to, to do it yourself, find your own information. That was a very inspiring story about how you just dug in and found that. But the internet can make that so much easier if we all organize together uh, with the data at this point. What we have to do is make sure that all of the information that you need is actually available and that you can add your own information from your own quantified self to yeah. that large pool of information and interact with it. Uh, Ted Goldstein here is in the first row. Uh, he's a uh, formal Apple, Apple VP, and he's building on this cancer project that I talked about earlier, creating a, a platform called Medbook, which will allow social network type interactions with between physicians, patients, people who are just interested in their health, and this vast reservoir of information that we will demand jointly that we will liberate, essentially. And another key piece of what you really believe is necessary is that we all as individuals really have control of our genetic data Absolutely. wherever it's stored, which is not basically the case now either. No. Another yeah. thing we discussed at the Global Alliance meeting in London a, a month ago was the fact that women who uh, are interested in or are directly affected by their BRCA1-2 status, and this is a gene, uh, the, those of you that are not familiar with it, that. Uh, makes you susceptible to breast cancer, um, are, are, want to know how they compare to all of the other women, and yet that data was locked up, as Drew said, uh, in, in, a, uh, in uh, a single company. Um, and now that the Supreme Court decision is down and we have this new feeling of free the data, we, we are all excited about these data being available. And the Global Alliance wants to help foster a massive global data sharing uh, on that scale. We also have a project called Beacon, where you can ask about specific genetic variants that occur in databases around the world. And as I said, we have our new API that will work. These things build on the methodologies that we created when we first did the human genome. The first thing we did was the genome browser, and that allowed you to look at that one representative genome and all of the biological information that's known about the different genes in it, and they were keyed to the locations within that one uh, reference genome. Now we have massive amounts of personal genomes, and we can extend that uh, vision beyond that. So the things uh, like browser in a box was just announced uh, just a few weeks ago. I don't know if you use the uh, browser, we have a million hits a day now. We're by far the most used uh, reference for the, the human genome. Um, and you can take that whole capability now and have it on your laptop with browser in a box. And you can do that where you have, you may, you may have information that you don't want to share with the rest of the world uh, in an unrestricted way. Maybe you're not part of George Church's personal genome project where you're literally going to po post, <coughs> excuse me, every DNA base in your genome on the internet for everybody to see. If you're not willing to do that, you still want to analyze your genome in the context of thousands of other genomes, you can do that with browser in a box. You, mm -hmm. you upload all of your information and then you can compare it. You can click any time that anybody's published a paper with anything on a DNA sequence or a protein sequence or a disease name, it's all keyed into that. It's like Google Maps 
very fast for, for disease exploration. Well, it's a little bit like what 23andMe was making possible, but a little bit more under the control of the individual. That's, I think, the vision, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what's exciting about what the new era With is an open that source 20, overlay. 23andMe is ba was based on uh, microarrays, which uh, access about uh, a hundredth of a percent of the genome. And we're talking about the whole thing, you know, three billion bases. One, I want to hear from the audience, so let's get the lights up. But I just quickly want to ask you, David, how much is government an ally and how much is it an impediment to what you're trying to do? If you presume that government is going to do this for you, then it's an impediment. Uh, there's no question about it. Because so they're not standing in the way, they, however? But they, they uh, the, the, uh, the, new, the current administration, uh, has been cheering us on at this point. They, they are very much in favor of the Global Alliance. I talk to government officials when I'm in Washington, which is far more than I would like to be, uh, that then they say, you know, go for it. You know, you, you can do what we can't do. Besides, it's a global organization. You can't have uh, the U.S. government declaring how uh, everybody in the world should share their genomic data. Who would take that seriously? We've um, got to do a non-governmental play People in Washington, perhaps, but, uh, but no, but, but I, that's great. That's good. Over here. Um, I'm Yuna Ryan from the Bay Area Bioeconomy Initiative, and I've agreed with almost everything I've heard so far in the meeting, but I still think we're worrying about the beginning of the story, um, the genomics, the molecules, the manufacturing, the sort of virus-sized problem. The, the elephant in the room that costs all that money and takes all that time in developing therapies are the clinical trials and the regulatory process. So following your question about the role of government, I want you to tell us how all our new technologies are going to help that or what you would substitute for um, safety and quality in whatever is manufactured in a distributed way. I mean, I can make a really bad cup of tea with my tea bag, you know, so I just want to know how, it, how you would envisage that happening. Quality. I, I mean, I, I've, I've been in, involved heavily in clinical development, so from, you know, first IND submission all the way through to phase one, phase two, phase three, and, and approval, post-approval work. Um, the FDA is slowly responding, so with the break, breakthrough status indication, that's kind of a response from the FDA. Uh, but uh, there are also other people willing to do things that are outside of at the FDA's purview. Um, there's grinders, so this is something very new, who are willing to uh, hack their own bodies. Um, and, and there are maybe a couple hundred grinders so far, but they'll do extreme things to their body that are not approved. Um, so either the regulation has to catch up or people are going to start taking the tools of biology and doing their own thing. Well, another thing, one of the implications yeah. of Andrew's argument in his first opening talk is that the FDA's rules apply, make no sense at all if you're developing drugs for individuals because you can't do the kind of testing that we've talked about in the past. So something has to completely give if we're going to move into that kind of a universe. It's sort of a way of trumping, in addition to its other virtues, the the uh, regulatory uh, backlog and, and this incredible problem we've had with the time it takes. Okay, we got one or two more quickly. Um, hello, my Can name I, is Arif yeah, Sheikh. Yep. Um, um, yeah, to, to Una's point, and also to everything that we're talking about, getting more people involved, and I think more people caring by using the right type of language to make information actually understandable is hugely important. What, what's going on with the quantified self and the distribution of data or devices that capture real biometric data that theoretically could be used in a clinical trial if those data were acceptable by the FDA. Um, and as a former employee of a medical device maker, you really don't want to go down the FDA route if you don't have to. But if people have their own data, if they have access to their own genetic data, nothing stops them from comparing theirs to the reference genome if it's available. And if you get data analysts in there with some training that you can get, say, at a community bio lab, then I think it's possible to get those same learnings which maybe don't have the same merit as clinical trial. Uh, it's a tough question. Uh, there's no way we're going to speed up the development of small molecules uh, in the current way that the 
pharmaceutical industry does to attack personalized medicine. Uh, my personal feeling is that our best bet is we will learn more about the immune system and how to tweak it. And I won't go into details because I see we're running out of time. Uh, but there are different technologies. I, I wouldn't, like Andrew, would uh, actually design a virus uh, to do this, but I would tweak the immune system. And I think uh, we're going to get into a case where there, instead of these slow clinical trials, we'll have a massive network of information that's constantly being shared on a real-time basis, and we're in this constant learning loop from this huge amount of information. And that is like one massive clinical trial on the internet where everybody, uh, all the information is as open as possible and the new technologies are coming up that aren't the traditional let's design a small molecule that can be put in a pill type uh, therapies. Another uh, way that just renders the current system essentially irrelevant in effect. Yes, yeah. it, will, it will force it to change. I wouldn't yeah. say render it irrelevant, but, but will force it to change. Okay, now somebody back there had a question. I want to let them ask it or comment, and then we've got to really wrap. All right, my name is Arish Sheikh. I'm a cell biologist. I, I basically, um, I started working with endothelial cells, and then I later went on some, to some project with the 293 HEC, HEC 293 cell line, um, doing some oncological research. And, um, and I, I actively participated in BioCurious Lab as a volunteer. Um, I don't have my own projects. I don't want to join on a membership basis, but I come in on a communal volunteer basis. But um, the question I have is, is there, any gonna, is there gonna be any wet lab assignment? Because my expertise is directly like wet lab and uh, working with cell culture and such these type of projects. Hey. <laughs> And I saw a number of BioCurious people. Um, it's great to have you all here. We have our middle schooler who comes to oh, <laughs> almost great. every Even single class schooler, we have. Um, and his dad who says, I'm just his dad, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, yeah, to speak to the wet lab um, work, I think it's a necessity. And it's that part of biology and life sciences that separates us from the digital world. It's not, it's not just an online kind of problem, although there's so much to be um, explored there. And we currently don't have coordinated resources. Um, I think we need to go back to, again, we keep referencing Drew, but there are problems with lack of standards and safety um, with data from a community lab being shared with a, a large company with a pharma included in a clinical trial. These are the sorts of standards that BioCurious, for example, doesn't have the capacity to solve yet. But we do get so many requests in, hey, do you have a scientist who could do this lab work for me? And there are people who'd rather be thinking about the problems and outsource the work. And I think it's, it's a place that we need to go. Maybe we can have that discussion here. Well, great. We have to wrap because we got a lot of other great stuff coming, but thank you to all three of you. It was a great conversation. Thank you, Ray. Thank you.